Yesterday I looked after a 90 year old patient who was involved in a motor vehicle accident or MVA. Uh, this 90 year old was actually at stop sign and was turning right at a very low speed at about 5 to 10 kilometers an hour when he got hit by another car at the driver's side which was traveling at about 40 kilometers an hour. On impact the airbags deployed in the patient's car hitting him in the chest. Had some chest pain at that point but was well enough to open the door and climb out of the car. Ambulance arrived, he was feeling fine, so declined to be transferred to the hospital. He called his son from the scene and the son said that, Dad, it's better that you go into hospital for an assessment. I saw him in our resuscitation area and I introduced myself and he was very chatty and he said that he feels fine um, and he just wanted to be quickly assessed so he can go back home to his wife. Uh, his blood pressure was 130 by 80 his um, heart rate was 69, uh, oxygen saturation was 99% on 2 litres of oxygen. I was a bit surprised that why he's on oxygen, but I thought, okay, fine, he's on 2 litres of oxygen, nothing major. And uh, the primary survey was fine. I mean, he did have some reduced air entry at both the lung bases, uh, but nothing major. And he did have some crackles onto the right side and onto the left side. So his heart, his abdomen, his pelvis, upper and lower limb examinations were completely normal. I did the vast scan and it looked like that he had uh, some free fluid in the right sided chest cavity, a small amount of free fluid. And I palpated his chest, he was not tender in the rib area. He had mild amount of tenderness as I said in the uh, external area. I would like to mention here, this patient had a past medical history of mitral valve replacement 15 years ago and he was on warfarin. The other medical history was that he had hypothyroidism and he was on thyroxine. Quite fit and healthy, no dementia, capable, drives around, very well functioning 90 year old. Now I've discovered the small amount of fluid in the right chest cavity and I'm thinking that he's on warfarin for um, valve replacement and could this be a sign that he's actually bleeding into the right chest cavity but this was only a small amount of blood. He was not particularly tender, he was not short of breath, but he was on oxygen. So I was a bit concerned here. So I mentioned to the son, look, there's some free fluid in the right chest. Let me just get the CT scans done quickly to get a better identification where this fluid of blood is coming from. The surgeon had already seen the patient and actually had not picked up this finding. And I called them and informed that, look, this patient has got a positive fast. We're going to send him to the CT scan. I was flipping through the images of his chest. On his right-sided uh, chest CT scan, it did look like that fluid has now increased in volume. It was now occupying the whole of the right um, chest cavity. So he had a right-sided hemothorax. He also had an evidence of sternal fracture and a few rib fractures. By the time he came back from the CT, I could now see some early bruising developing on his chest. And uh, I repeated the fast scan and now the volume had also increased on uh, the bedside fast scan. So it clearly looked like that he's bleeding into his right chest. I immediately alerted the surgeons and as they came down, the patient actually now dropped his blood pressure. His blood pressure, which was sitting normally at 130, had suddenly dropped to 80. I gave him a fluid bolus of 500 mils only, in the blood bank, and asked them to send me two pack red cells, two units of FFPs, and also prothrombin X. Uh, I gave him vitamin K, 10 milligrams intravenously to reverse the warfarin. And obviously, the FFP and the prothrombin X are also aiming to reverse the warfarin more acutely. We gave him uh, ketamine sedation. He had a right-sided intracostal catheter or chest drain put in, returning about 900 mils of blood immediately. The interventional radiologist and uh, they had a look at the images and they could see that it was the internal thoracic artery or memory artery which was bleeding into the right chest. That could be consequential to the rib fractures. After two units of packed red cells, uh, two units of FFPs and 1500 units of prothrombin X, the patient was now hemodynamically stable. His blood pressure had come back up to 130 by 80. He was never tachycardic. Even when he dropped his blood pressure to 80 systolic, he never mounted a tachycardic response. Um, he was not in any beta blocker, calcium channel blockers. The patient was transferred to interventional radiology in a stable condition. He was successfully angioembolized and then later moved on to ICU. So this geriatric patient taught me a lot, uh, that geriatric patients can give you this false sense of security with their very stable hemodynamic status. 
his blood pressure was stable. Uh, he was not tachycardic despite the fact that he was actively bleeding in his right chest. So we need to be very, very careful evaluating geriatric trauma patients, especially the ones who are on warfarin, epixaban, and, and one of the other NOACs. Why do geriatric patients don't mount a tachycardic response? Catecholamine insensitivity. The heart's just not responding to the catecholamine in circulating in their body. Um, they could have atherosclerosis. They could have um, uh, been on medication like calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. This patient wasn't, but the geriatric patients can be expected to be on these medications. A stable hemodynamic status in a geriatric trauma patient is not an indication that they are 100% okay. Warfarin reversal in this patient was very important. He had a prostatic mitral valve replacement about 15 years ago. And we were quite methodical in our approach to reverse the warfarin. He obviously had an immediate vitamin K given 10 milligrams dose IV. Uh, we gave him two units of FFPs plus 1500 units of prothrombin X, which was calculated roughly at a rate of about 20 units per kilogram. He weighed about 60, 65 kilos. After that, our plan was to repeat the INR. His initial presenting INR was three. And if the INR is still elevated and his chest range shows that he's still actively bleeding, then we're going to repeat further two units of FPs and further dosage of 1500 units of X. So we are not completely giving him reversal, but actually taking it stepwise. So we're not going to give him any of the thrombotic uh, complications. I also had a chat to a hematologist at that point, and he also advised to check his fibrinogen level. Uh, if he's hypofibrinogenemic, then we can give him cryoprecipitate. The patient, however, did respond to the first two units of FPs, two units of packed red cells, plus um, prothrombin X, and he was transferred in a stable condition to interventional radiology, controlling or source controlling his bleeding. Also be mindful that geriatric patients can decompensate from over-aggressive resuscitation as much as they can decompensate from an under-resuscitation. So if you need to replenish the volume, make sure it's either blood or blood products. Giving that too much fluids will cause hemodilution. Fluids also don't have oxygen carrying capacity. So that will also cause further tissue underperfusion, deoxygenation, more acidosis, which will cause coagulopathy. Be judicious and careful in your resuscitation in elderly patients. Obviously this patient decompensated quite rapidly and unexpectedly. Uh, make sure that you have got family on board with the idea. I had the son uh, who was there initially, he had left for home, um, but I called him and let him know what has happened and what is going to happen. And he came back immediately and was very thankful for the intervention. Be careful about the geriatric patient. They can often give you a false sense of security with their stable hemodynamics uh, and they can hide very serious injuries. Uh, look out for yourself, stay safe. Thank you very much.